initiative with the London School of Economics, the 30% Club and MasterCard. Um, I'm really delighted to be here today. I am Grace Lord and I am the director of the Inclusion Initiative. And we're going to hear in a moment from um, Erica Brodnock who will launch the Transparent Framework, which is a new research study that she led for the Inclusion Initiative of the LSE. Um, before we get to Erica to tell us about the study, I'm going to do um, introductions to my panel. Um, first, I will introduce Erica, who is an award-winning entrepreneur, um, founder of software companies Charisma Kids and Cami. Um, I'm privileged to work with her at the Inclusion Initiative of the LSE, and she is the lead author of what we're here to discuss today, which is Transparent Framework, um, Creating Organizations Inclusive of Black Women in Finance, Professional Services, and Big Technology. So welcome, Erica. I'm delighted that you're here. Thank you, guys. Um, continuing in alphabetical order, next is Anne Hearns, the Executive Vice Chair at MasterCard, Global Chair of the 30% Club, the Chair of the Financial Alliance for Women, and the lead of the Non-Executive Board of the Department for Business, Energy, and the Industrial, um, Industrial Strategy. Our future of work is in your hands, Anne, and you're also the lead sponsor of the Transparent Framework that we're discussing today, so welcome. Thank you. Um, Next, Alexandra Fay, or Alex, is an Asset Management Product Development Manager at Lion Trust. Alex is a mentor and a contributor to a numerous d &I initiatives. And this year she won, and it was rightfully deserved, the We Are The City Rising Star Award in the Investment Management category. Welcome, Alex. Thank you. Um, and last but definitely not least, Dr. Heather Melville. Heather is the Director of Head and Client Experience at PwC. She's the Chair of CMI Women, and she is the Senior Patron of the Women in Banking and Finance. Heather also has an OBE for her services to female entrepreneurs, diversity in business and gender equality. Welcome, Heather. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for everyone for being here. Um, and I'm going to start, Erica, by turning over to you so you can give us some of the key findings from the research and what you hope will be achieved through the launch of the Transparent Framework to set the scene for the audience. Thank you, Grace. Um, so uh, first and foremost, I'd like to, um, to thank Grace um, and the um, Inclusion Initiative, as well as MasterCard and the 30% Club for enabling this research. Um, then I'd like to thank the 44 amazing women that gave up their time um, to be interviewed for, um, for this piece of research. Without them, none of this would be possible. Um, and I guess, for me, one of the most striking things about this research was that um, of the, um, the 44 women I interviewed, um, not one had, um, uh, had been able to mention that they had been asked questions in, in the way that I was asking them um, at any point in their career. And I think that that's pretty poignant because often we're seeing initiatives that are designed to, um, to help uh, black women and indeed other disadvantaged groups in the workplace and I think that we need to adopt um, a philosophy of nothing for us without us um, and that speaks to um, actually including the people who are going to be the key beneficiaries of any steps that are going to be taken in all of the decision making processes around what those steps are going to be. Um, as I say, it was pretty poignant that, that none of the women had been asked about um, how they felt uh, about working in their organisations. Um, after that, um, we were able to find that um, a number of the women wanted to see um, true um, and, and actually transparent systemic change um, that was going to be organization-wide um, and um, impactful. What we, what, you know, what, what the women said was that there were lots of initiatives that were um, being undertaken, such as reverse mentoring in some cases um, and um, uh, unconscious bias training, but oftentimes those initiatives were being led um, by people that weren't necessarily um, as committed as they could be to creating the systemic change that's, uh, that's required. 
lots of women um, spoke about having um, diversity and inclusion tagged onto their paid job role and it becoming a bit of a side of the desk task. Um, and so I guess for the organisations that are on the line um, on the call today, one of the things that I would implore you to do is ensure that d &I initiatives in your organisations are actually funded and um, are taken on um, by not just um, the HR team and d &I leads, but actually run through um, the entire organisation like a stick of rock and are linked to um, to pay and promotion um, so that everybody is committed to ensuring um, a, a much fairer organisation. Um, team culture uh, was, was one of uh, the key things that came up in, in the research from, from, I think, I don't think there were very many women who didn't mention something around um, uh, the culture of their team and the, um, the impact of a good or bad line manager um, uh, on, on their ability to thrive and progress within their organisations. So ensuring that um, women aren't ending up stuck under, um, under managers that um, aren't committed to ensuring that, that, um, that black women progress across organisations is, is critical as we, as we begin to move forward. Finally, um, I'm, I'm going to give a mention to the power of advocacy. Um, lots of black women had been mentored, very few had been sponsored. And I think that it's critical, critically important and vital um, that we ensure that people become committed to the sponsorship of black women, to opening doors for them, to ensuring that they are able to progress through their organisations and to thrive within those organisations and indeed um, to be paid their worth um, and in in line with their peers. You're on mute, Grace. Thank you, Erica, for that excellent summary. We have Michelle and Nina and Leanne inside in the chat agreeing with you, saying that they 100% agree that this is totally right. And um, for the audience members, please do put questions into the chat and I will be dispersing them through the conversations and you can also upvote each other's. Um, I'm going to turn to Heather now and ask her, because I know you've read the entire report, Heather, before today, as well as Erica's synopsis. So was there anything surprising or particularly impactful that you took from the transparent framework? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing I can say. So thank you, first of all, for bringing that report to everybody's minds uh, and, and actually being brave and publishing it. So thank you, Anne, from MasterCard and to LSC for doing this, because this needed to be this needed to be out there for people to see. We've been experiencing this for many, many years. We've talked about it and we've talked about it and we've talked about it. There is something about black women. Um, and I'm going to say this because I think it's really important around resilience. It's in their blood. It's been there since slavery. And, and, I, and where I think and why I'm going to be brave and say this is somebody's just put in the chat. You're absolutely right. I call it the S word. Right. We need to integrate the S word into all of our careers. Mentoring is lovely to now and again have a nice little chat here and there. Um, it, it, it's on somebody's agenda. I've mentored Heather. So that's good. I've done my bit. But actually, no, where I have seen change and I can say this having worked. Uh, in financial sector for many, many years, where I was sponsored um, by Alison Rose. I, and I'm happy to say that because she is a, a woman of example, a leader who really has put her money where her mouth is. And also, you know, Ross McEwen, when I worked for him, he wanted to know what it felt like to be a black woman wo working in his organisation. And he wanted to make sure we used that word black. Now, I say that because many organisations, first of all, they're scared of what might come out. So actually, they don't want us to talk about it and they suppress some of the findings. It's OK. And let's put it together with BAME. It's fine. And, and we're we're making some progress. But actually, when we strip it back and we see the amount of black women, the talented black women that are in organisations and we see the roles that they have and we see how often they are told that they're aggressive, not assertive, but aggressive. I said that mean, means people become quite suppressed and to get the best out of talent. We need to allow them to be innovative. We need them to have a voice at the table. We need them to be included in the discussions. And I love that thing. Nothing for us without us. I'm fed up of people talking about us as though we're a little project. We need fixing. 
We don't need fixing. What we need are the opportunities that everybody else has for them to shine. On Friday night, there is the, uh, the Black Excellence Awards dinner, right? The top 100 most powerful Black people in the UK are identified. I happen to proudly be one of the judges, and I can tell you it's a very, very painful process. Having been on the list myself, I was very grateful that I got onto it, having seen what the judging process is like. But most importantly, when I judge lots of other awards, I see the work that goes underneath it. But I see the scrutiny that really goes under the black power list, because what they're doing is they are highlighting role models, men and women who have achieved greatness, who may not have been recognized in their organizations, that are doing great things. But they're not just they just don't have a fancy title. They also are doing things to take the course to the next level. So they are sponsoring women, they are running initiatives, they are putting their own money into, into programs that allow women and black men to succeed. And so this is why I think that this, um, this research is amazing because when you give people the data and put it in front of them, they cannot run away from it and hide. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, one, one thing that surprised me, and, and, and Anne, I'll get you to, to react to this, or I didn't know, was, was how much, how many Black women actually left financial services, technology and professional services to become entrepreneurs. So, were, so you know, we're actively losing talent from big organisations. I'm wondering, is there anything that surprised you in the report? Or like Heather, are you just waiting for action? Well, I kind of, I'm with Heather in the sense that I actually saw so many things that I just think we know um, are happening. But one of the things that did surprise me, and then I did a little bit of digging behind it, was um, the fact that um, women coming from abroad seem to be having a much better experience here than women who grew up in Britain. And, um, and I know that there could be you know, socioeconomic reasons for that. Um, and uh, that's obviously, that's often a hidden thing. I mean, I, I grew up in a very working class environment and, um, and know the impact of that. But, um, but then when I sort of asked a few of my friends a bit more about this, um, particularly black women that I'm working with inside my own company, um, it seemed to be much more about um, how you're treated as a child. So, for instance, one of the women that I talked to um, is Nigerian and grew up in Nigeria and is a senior executive in our company. And she was in the ma majority. You know, she, she grew up feeling good about herself, the whole environment. Um, subsequently, by the way, she's moved abroad and had some pretty interesting experiences that she never had at home, you know, being being uh, mistaken for her own cleaner, basically, um, pretty awful. Um, you know, on the on the sort of other side of things, I, I, I spoke recently to a, a woman I know who grew up in Britain, and she told me that from a really young age, from going to school, she always felt like, oh, you know, my nose looks like this, my lips are like this, my, my hair's frizzy. People were saying to her things like, oh, um, when they met her, oh, you don't sound like a black person, as a kind of compliment outrageous i mean when you think about it how we feel and think about ourselves as children influences the whole of the rest of our lives so i thought bringing that out was was a really impactful and interesting thing and causes you to think about how you behave towards people you know when they're young and in the, you know in the work environment so fascinating report thank you i'm and last but definitely not least, Alex, you're the future of the city. Was there anything in particular that was impactful for you in the report? Um, yes, so I would definitely agree with the um, the lack of role models, uh, especially in our industry. Uh, for I think it's only in the last three, four years that I've actually seen some meaningful changes, I would say, you know, more diversity and inclusion inclusion-led initiatives, you know, more networks like Black Women in Asset Management, for instance, or um, talk about Black, where you could actually see yourself represented. Um, I used to joke with my friends that for a very long time, I felt like a unicorn, 
in this industry. I thought it was just me because I, I was really struggling to find other people that look like me working in sales or, you know, um, or being client facing. And um, I think just realizing that in the research, a lot of other women are experiencing exactly the same. So we need to see some action and from companies really to increase that representation. Fantastic. Thank you, Alex. One of the things that Anne mentioned actually was, and you mentioned that you came from a lower socioeconomic, um, a lower SES background. And one of the things that came out of the report was that people who had one aspect of diversity were possibly better at helping people with another aspect of diversity along the way or individuals with intersectionality. So, so really focusing on underrepresented groups. Do you identify with that? And what does that then mean for managers who are from white, middle-class, privileged um, backgrounds with respect to making them become inclusive leaders? Um, yeah, I, I do think that the things that you're exposed to in life influence you tremendously, the way that you grow up and the way that you think about things. Um, I actually think that um, suddenly coming across something in your life which causes a change in the way that you're thinking could be very impactful. The reason I'm saying this, Grace, is that I grew up in a mining village in the northeast of England and, um, and um, you know, parents never went to university, left school at 14, this kind of thing. But also, I'd never met a black person <laughs> I mean, that just didn't exist in my environment. Isn't that, I mean, shocking, right? I then went to university in Sheffield to study maths. And, um, and in my first year, one of my flatmates was from Nigeria, Pauline. And she was older than us. She was a third year. Um, she she uh, was an well, incredible person. And, and her husband was actually a gynecologist. Um, and uh, that was the first person that I came across at the age of 18. And I think that these kind of things, suddenly seeing the world through completely different lens, meeting people from all sorts of different walks of life, is the thing that starts to build your thinking about things. Um, and I, I, I think that um, if you grow up in a certain environment, whereas you say, you know, let's say you grew up in a very privileged environment where there wasn't anybody else in your environment that you knew personally that you could relate to from any other class or from any other background. Yes, it would be extremely limiting and it would be fixing your ideas about society and the world and um and be very bad longer term heather do i see your hand you do you do it's really interesting um because and i went to school in north london my parents were working class they worked extremely hard um and they came from the caribbean they're part of the windrush but they always made me feel as though i was important and they invested in both myself and my sister so that we could have the best education we could have we had white friends and we were, although they weren't in our family, and my family has a mixture of black and white people in that family, as times have gone, my white friends were welcomed into our home, into our background. And actually, it was a natural thing for us to be friends. We never felt that we were less than. About four or five years ago, um, we had, I worked at another organisation and we had a day when you could bring your children in. And this is, this is now. So this isn't 30 or 40 years ago. And one of the guys brought his daughter in and they lived in the middle of deepest, darkest Essex and she'd never seen a black person. She said to me, that lady's skin is black. Why? And I said, Beyonce's skin's black. Do you know Beyonce? She said, yes. I said, so Beyonce has the same colour skin as I have. But she just never realised that. And so when you come into the workplace, for me, it's about embracing difference. Right. Mm -hmm. we, we the organisations that have a, the biggest inclusive organisations are those that are driving towards success because they want the best people. They want the best talent. They want people who have a different opinion, who will challenge, who will also bring things to the table. And what we're doing with this report, which is why I think it's so great that MasterCard is actually sponsoring this. 
Yes, many black people leave the workplace, men and women, and become very successful entrepreneurs. And those very successful entrepreneurs have a very deep memory. They remember the organizations that they worked at, and they remember the organizations that didn't give them a chance to thrive. So they take their business somewhere else. And also what they do is they tell somebody else to take their business somewhere else. So I think we're in a place now where organizations have got to stop talking about this as it's a little project and start talking about it like COVID. If you remember when COVID happened, there were loads of organizations in my own organization at the time, including finance, who were, well, people can't work from home. There's no way they need to be in front of the clients. There's absolutely no way. And then COVID came along. And most organizations saw the most progressive and commercially insightful years they've had in their history throughout COVID because all their people they empowered to work differently in a different place um, just rose to the top. So I think where we're at the moment now is thinking to ourselves with organizations, this is a war on talent. We want the best talent. We want to retain them. We want to attract them and we need to develop them. So there are a couple of things that organizations need to think about when they look at this topic. So first of all, what is our culture like? Really, what is our culture? Not, not what the HR person tells us. What really is our culture like? Organize heads of businesses like yourself who really care about this stuff. They go and talk to the black people unaided and say tell me what your lived experience is like I want to know what it feels like every day when you walk in that door from whether the security guard lets you in with your pass to whether they say well I need to see your pass three or four times how does that make people feel so that's one of the things the other thing is creating an inclusive organization there are lots of microaggressions that exist out there did you really go to that university do you really live in that place do, do your parents really have this all of those little really things are microaggressions that happen. And actually, we find with black women, they internalize them a lot more. Um, and so the microaggressions that happen sometimes don't come from men, I have to say. Sometimes they come from white women in the workplace who have really fought to get that space as a woman there. And now they're saying, actually, I don't see that we can have much space for the black women that are there. We all agree the 30% club has done amazing with getting 30% of women on boards. But you know, Anne, I've challenged that, you know, we've always had black women who are talented, who are not sponsored, who don't have the exposure, who we need to get so that they can become part of that 30%. They are part of the economy. They are part of the success that we're making. So we need to include them. And the other side I want to say is that I want our own black women to stop feeling like they're victims. We are not victims and we don't need to be fixed. What we need to do is step up and step out. Let people know we've arrived. Let's work collaboratively with them. Let's show them what good looks like. And let's make them feel, actually, if you do not hold on to the talent that is in your organisation right now, they have a choice. Because right now, the marketplace is so volatile. We are seeing people... People who are junior managers, middle managers being whooped from their organisations and they're going into much senior roles. So when that happens, that makes me think the war on talent is definitely out there. Black Lives Matter just highlighted it. I think the fact that how much does it cost an organisation every time you lose a talented individual? Um, and, and at the moment, there are lots of people going after black people and black women. My only concern about that is it becomes a tick box exercise. Let's bring them into the organization. Whoops, we've done our bit, but actually what are we doing to create a culture that they will be successful in that? And that's where it becomes a discussion that involves really the, the board of that organization while they create a strategy which says, this war on talent means that we need to have the best people working for us. That means we need to create a culture where they feel that they're part of it, they're included, their voices are heard. You know, we bring them into the conversation. You know, I was brought in front of the board when I worked at the, the bank by Alison. She took me to the board and gave me 25 minutes exposure in front of the board. And when I asked her, do I, do I need to go through what I'm saying? She goes, I absolutely trust you. I'm empowering you to do that. And she did. And I often blame her for the person I've become because she truly was a role model and a sponsor. And there are other women out there and other men. I've had some amazing men, white men who've been behind me. I am now privileged to be a part of that powerless group, part of CMI, part of Women in Banking and Finance. 
I sit on there as, you know, the first black patron they've had. But we've not stopped there. I've challenged them and said, hold on a minute. Why do we not have any black women in the committee? And I have to say, our president has gone out and she said, right, we're going to find one. I said, I'm going to give you a name. She has been in the banking community for many, many years. She's an executive at a Japanese bank. You go and speak to her. Then no one knew about her. How many more women are not known about because they don't put their hands up or they don't have a sponsor to talk about them? They get ignored. Now, she is on that board. And actually, well, what we've got finance on here, which means that we are looking to bring through the talent that sits in many of those organisations that many of us have worked on. So I leave you with the thought of culture. Let's forget about diversity because I think diversity creates all kinds of divisions and it makes people think the job's done. But we need to create an inclusive culture where when those women come into work, they can come into work feeling they're part of something, they're empowered, their voices are heard and the sponsorship that's there. I'm doing something uh, next week to really help the white women who are at the top of their game become sponsors to women from different ethnic bio, uh, backgrounds. Now, that means I'm not telling them you need to you know, find medicine to give them because they need fixing. Hell no. What I am saying are that these women have come from a different place. They're, how we communicate with them needs to be the same way we communicate with everybody else. But we need to hear what challenges they have. And I think resilience cuts right across that. If you cut most black women, and I'm going to say that, most women, but most black women, resilience is right through the middle of them because they've had to fight from the early years right through to in their 50s and 60s, they're still fighting. So for me, the timing of this report could not have come at a better time. And I think it needs to be thrown, whilst I don't get involved in politics and in my own views, it needs to be thrown right underneath the nose of Boris so that he now takes this and all the heads of all the businesses, the C-suite, for them to say, we are now going to do something about this because we have got the data. We've got all the information we need. We don't need to interview any more black women because had black women been interviewed 20 or 30 years ago, the findings would have been exactly the same. The only thing that would have been missing would have been technology. Erica, I, I, I see you nodding at, at, at some crucial points. Do you want to um, weigh in? I'd, I'd love to weigh in um, just because one uh, Heather's um, literally uh, a, a, a woman of my own heart because um, I've, I've been saying this and one of the things that was recommended in the report is that we start to look at what professionalism looks like um, you'll you'll all note that my hair is locked um, and I'm I'm so sat here looking professional many black women that we interviewed in this research report were presumed to be deficient unless they proved themselves um, but then also they were were often challenged about the way that they look heather mentioned microaggressions but didn't sort of mention hair which is one of the biggest um issues that the, the women that um, I spoke to raised, where if their hair's worn in an afro or curly or in its natural state in any way, shape or form, they're presumed to be less professional. If they go to work wearing clothing that would also be worn by their counterparts, um, they're, they're challenged about how professional they look. Um, and I think that what we need to do is start to look at the, the photographs that we have in um, public spaces in organisations organizations. We need to start to think about the way in which literature is going out and the messaging that's going beside that literature. For example, um, many well-meaning firms only place black women in literature when they're speaking about disadvantage or um, around uh, about mentoring programs, etc. And actually, what, where are the black women when we're speaking about leaders and leadership? Um, and where are the black women in the, in the foyer um, welcoming people to the business? We are professional too, we're well qualified. And, and I think that there is an opportunity for um, organizations to get behind a campaign that shouts about black women and ensures that they are seen as being professional, they are seen as being proficient um, and indeed capable of of leadership um, uh, positions and sitting on boards etc so um, I, I for one thank Heather for everything that she just said and would just add with with that 
Thank you, Erica. And, and I should say the report is out today and it's filled with actions that companies can take. So as Heather and Erica have said, we want to kind of stop talking and start taking actions. MasterCard have sponsored it, but we are looking for other companies to become involved. So do either reach out to TII, myself or Erica, and we can point you in the right direction. And speaking of action over words, Alex, are there any particular actions that you would like big companies or even SMEs to take today that you think that could really move things forward? Definitely. And I think I would uh, repeat some things that, you know, Heather and Erica have said, um, the, the work around unconscious biases, especially in my industry, we still haven't really moved in terms of what a professional, you know, banker look, should look like. And I think unless we actually do the work um, internally and externally, uh, black women will always be disadvantaged. Um, secondly, um, in terms of transparency, um, I do think that, you know, there are really good findings around pay gaps, for instance, in the report. And I think unless we do understand how decisions are made when it comes to paying people, uh, promoting people in, and sponsoring people in the business, um, we'll not make any progress. So we definitely need action from companies in terms of how transparent they are in making those decisions. And just coming back again to um, sponsorship uh, and mentoring. So mentoring is widely available, you know, internally and externally in companies, um, definitely. Sponsorship, not so much. And I would like to say that, especially I just, when you start and even like when you become a, a middle manager, uh, it can be a very lonely uh, experience as a black woman, because um, you don't really have um, role models or you don't know where to find the role models. You don't really have um, access to people who, are, who would understand your experience, you know, especially when you're going through difficult moments uh, in the workplace. And um, so having access to networks of people who can understand that. And also um, it doesn't even have to be just you know, other black women, that's important, obviously, but people who are more open to, uh, you know, uh, understanding this would be very, very helpful. So from my perspective, it's definitely around also the um, systemic cultural change that we need to see in the, in the workplace around more inclusive um, culture. So one thing that I, that I find really interesting about the systemic cultural change is that some of the women that Erica spoke to really talked about the fact that they were having to adapt within their companies in order to fit in and to get promoted. And I mean, I, somebody um, who might, might want to speak to this can show, can show me their hand, but I, I'm interested in what does that actually do to their diversity then? So if we're forcing diverse talent to adapt within conversations, we're probably losing the competitive edge that the same diverse talent is actually bringing to, bringing to organizations. And, and every time you, you, you know, people, people kind of raise, you know, um, cultural awareness training, I think as well, we have to have training where people realize that if you're a leader in 2021, it's actually a good thing if you're uncomfortable in your meeting room and people are telling you things that you don't know because they're giving you an, a comp competitive edge. But we still seem to be stuck in the old system where we want people to share the type of views that we have. Um, Anne, could I take a reaction from you, if you're willing? Sure, absolutely. Look, um, I, you know, I think that we are stuck in some old environments, but I think that some of the better companies are looking at this. And actually, I think if I look at my own company, um, Black Lives Matter did cause a change inside the company. Um, and we launched a big project in America called Solidarity that actually started to look across the company and say, are we actually using um, companies in our supply chain that are led by black leaders? Are we actually um, working with black communities across cities in, in America to actually help them get access to technology um, or maybe to some of the COVID funding they need or just the VC funding that they need. And uh, what do we look like inside the company? We were unhappy actually with what we looked like inside the company in terms of, we looked at the number of VPs and above we had from the black community in America. And we said, we want at least double that by 2025. So um, now in Britain, 
we we have an arm of solidarity in Britain, which is a um, you know a, a business group that's actually been waiting for this report, report to come out. Not waiting. I mean, there's lots of things that we're doing, but they're saying what are the one or two things that are really going to move the needle on this? And I think some of the audience are asking this, Grace. Yep. Um, and uh, and I think it's very important to ask that question. And I'm totally with Heather on the sponsorship side. I think it is sponsorship. We're not trying to fix people. We're trying to get people to get up the corporate ladder to get the visibility they need. And I think in order to do that, you've got to have transparency in the first place. I do, um, oh, by the way, the um, Black Excellence Awards, MasterCard are, are sponsoring that. I know. And we're giving the, uh, I think it's the FinTech Awards, so we're very mm -hmm. excited about that. But, but I do want to say also on the 30% Club, Heather and I have talked about this in the past and said, you know, what's happening there? Because a lot of the movements that pushed gender equality seem to be just pushing it for women that looked like me. Let's be honest. And that's just not right. We should be doing it for all women. We're 50% of the human race. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and last year, we actually came out in the 30% Club and said, we're aligning with the Parker Report. We want at least one person of colour on every board in Britain, FTSE 350. But because we're the 30% Club, we care about intersectionality and we want 50% of those board seats to go to women of colour. And I know that that doesn't solve the problem, by the way, for black women, because black women are a subset of women of colour, mm -hmm. right? There are many other um, people in that category. And I do think that, you know, you have to think about role models, which is why having somebody like Dame Sharon White being the chair of John Lewis, that's important. Having 13 female black MPs in Britain is really important. Um, and, and identifying and sponsor, sponsoring those women that can actually step up and take the next board position. We have a black woman on our board in MasterCard. And in America, I actually um, sponsor a thing inside our own organization that started with women on boards and I've moved to blacks on boards in America, which is actually working really well. And I'm thinking about what we can do now for that in Britain. So I think there are things that you know, you can do practically that move the needle, but you have to be really honest with yourself. Look in the mirror and go, what am I actually doing? Heather. Yeah, well said, Anne. Um, you know, I sit here and I say to myself, times are changing, but they're not changing quickly enough. Erica, I want to address you about the thing about here. I think it's ex really important. But I also think as black women, we need to feel comfortable about our hair as well. Because I remember many years working at you know at IBM I was the only black person in sales and I had my hair in braids and it was a black woman that said to me I don't think you should have your hair in braids that's not good for your career and I had to correct her and say by the way when IBM interviewed me for this job I had my hair in braids and so I'm going to wear my hair in braids because I'm traveling and it's the most convenient for me and I love my hair in braids so you need to get good you need to get comfortable in your skin see me with my hair in braids so the, I, I mentioned that because if we're not comfortable in our own skin other people are not comfortable in our skin the other thing I want to say is how we deal with the passive aggressive behaviors so often I've been the only woman and the only black woman in the world that I've worked in I walked into a meeting where I just picked up a new region we didn't have google then so they couldn't see who I was I came in, I put my lovely, nice Mont Blanc pen and my Louis Vuitton folder on the table. And I tell you these things because it's important. Put them on the table. Somebody walked in and asked me if I would mind pouring a cup of coffee for them. So do you know what? I, it was the nicest coffee I'd ever poured for anybody. I made it just right and I gave it to him. And he sat down and started to drink it. And can you imagine how he felt? when other people came into the room and said, oh, have you met our new head, Heather Melville? All the colour drained out of his face. The lesson I learned then, act with pride and integrity. Act like you own that space. Don't act like we're, you know, we need to fight for that space. We're there already. 
And when we're there already, if there's no one else around, let's make sure whilst we're there, we're confident. And if we need to cry, let's cry outside of the room or let's tap into our network. I'm very privileged that I've developed an amazing network of both black and white women who are my circle of trust. Whatever I am going through, I can reach out to them. And I would urge everybody, all 100 and however many of you on this call, look around who is in your circle of trust. As black women, we're quite often taught not to share. Don't tell anyone. We can't trust anybody. And what we do is we isolate ourselves from the knowledge that we need to be able to act and create those roles. So when we're going for that first big role, do we know what we should be paid? Absolutely not because it's a closed environment. No one tells you what they're getting paid. And you're so grateful. Oh, by the way, I'm taking out that word grateful because times have changed. We don't have to be grateful anymore. Our women are coming out of universities and out of jobs extremely well-educated and with lots and lots of great experience. So you don't need to be grateful anymore. You need to hold that position that you've got, but you need to know what you should be paid that is fair. And you will only know that when you speak to another woman. And I have to say, women are much more open to saying well Heather that job pays that amount of money that's what you should ask for so I want to see people on this call start to develop their own circle of trust it, it's something that takes time develop that be comfortable confident in the clothes that you wear and when anyone says anything you just say by the way you might not like it but the clients that I go and see they love how I look and how I feel when I'm in my space and my final point is Let's have a voice at the table. Quite often, we're all very shy because we're the minority. We don't put our hands up. We don't, we don't make a question. We don't ask a question. But guess what? If you watch men and how they operate, there's no such thing as a silly question for them. They ask a question so that the person in the room remembers who they are. And they will come back to them later on and say, you know your question, I might not have answered it at the time, but let's have a coffee. And I think we need to get to that place. And my thing is around go where you are celebrated, not where you are tolerated. Now is our time. We're on the agenda. Black women, women are on the agenda more than ever before. And even if we have a bad experience in the workplace, let's not dwell on that bad experience. Think about the how you've grown as a result of that experience you've had. And once we start to do that and we share our stories with other women, we will start to feel different and we own our place at this is where we belong. And if you don't want me, I'm going to your competitor because your competitor will want me. And I think that's where we need to get to. Um, Heather, Erica, Alex and Anne, just to say that in the chat, we have words like inspiring. Heather, you're being called remarkable. Um, and they're saying that you have great points. You're owning the room. Um, so thank you. Really great reactions from the audience. And please do keep the questions um, still coming. Erica, I think I saw your hand go up. Yes, um, again, uh, one of the, um, the points that Heather made there is something that has come out of the research. We've actually been calling for um, organisations to get behind us creating a network of um, uh, black women, but any woman that wants to, um, to, to join um, so that we are able to provide that space where people can meet buddies, they can meet peers um, and, uh, and network with them on a regular basis um, and, and check pay etc another one of the recommendations or, or positive actions in the report was around um, making pay transparent so giving people um, benchmarks that they should be aspiring to when they are going for particular roles um, just so that black women aren't then being paid as much as 30 percent less than their peers which is again something that came up um, in in some of the interviews um, and but that is on organisations. That's not necessarily on black women themselves. We can provide um, uh, circles in which black women can belong um, and get that peer support. But actually, organisations need to be transparent about pay. Organisations need to ensure that black women belong and feel comfortable. I, I completely agree with some of the comments that are being made and some of the, um, the, uh, some of the points that you've made, Heather, about black women owning their space and being comfortable and being confident in their own skin. That is absolutely true. 
what I, I, I want to be careful we don't verge into is that black women are forced to fix the problems that they didn't create and particularly that they don't have the budget to, to be able to fix. The organisations are the people with the power here. The people that sit at the tops of their organisations have the ability to sit um, and look around the room and see if there is full representation in that room. If you have people of colour in the room and you don't have a black woman in the room, it's your responsibility to make sure that that changes. And it's your responsibility to make sure that it isn't a revolving door so that you have one black woman come in and one black woman go out and another one come in and another one go out. We need to be building a, an infrastructure that means that black women can feel comfortable within that organization and want to stay. One is not enough. If, if we get to a place where there is just one black woman on, on every board, et cetera, what happens according to Gompas and Cavalli is that uh, if you're the only one of your kind in a in a sea of every uh, everybody else that looks the same you then turn around and are forced to assimilate you don't want to put your head above the parapet because of the fact that um you you could be um out outcast and and um the in out group phenomenon becomes incredibly apparent and as grace mentioned earlier that means that all of the diversity that you were actually brought in for ends up being lost so one is an enough and not in 2021 we um black women represent just over two percent of the population there's no reason why they shouldn't be two percent of um of of the management teams within organizations at the very least um and and so i think that there's lots of work to be done and black women do need to own their space but actually we need to be creating environments in which black women can own their spaces without fear of reprisal or fear of being called aggressive when they are being assertive etc 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 erica can and you speak, can you speak a little bit to the in-group out-group phenomenon and favoritism because i think we've, we've covered microaggressions we've covered racism but how favoritism causes gaps i think is really striking Absolutely. So one of the, thank you, Grace. Um, one of the, the key things that came up was, was this phenomenon of meritocracy, where people are promoted um, and indeed hired because they look like the hiring manager and they sound like the hiring manager. Many women spoke about the fact that actually um, most of the deals that are done within their organisations are done on golf courses. And um, whether that be a combination of being black, being female, or being from a lower socioeconomic class, they're not in those organ. Uh, they're, they're not in those institutions to be able to be making those deals. So again it's I, I don't know that we force the black woman to contort herself into the golf playing um uh middle-aged white man because she can't physically do that so we need to then turn around and create other spaces that these deals can happen that aren't based on meritocracy but are based on meritocracy a true meritocracy that means that if you work hard enough you'll be recognized for it and you'll be promoted for it whereas actually in in many instances um uh, the the words that came up was that i needed to move out in order to move up there shouldn't be a system um, in place at the moment where women feel that they need to leave an organisation in order to be paid their worth or to be promoted um, because they are being stopped and blocked. If they're not worthy of the promotion and they're not talented, then that's fine. But I think that it's a loss to the organisation as much as it is to the black woman if 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 your talent is is draining through the door purely because of the colour of their skin. Thank you so much, Erica. Alex, I have, I have a question for you, given your role in asset management. One thing that came through in the report that was really striking for me is the number of Black women who are having to forge their way in unique niches that are definitely riskier. They're obviously bringing high levels of innovation um, into companies because traditional career paths, because of the meritocracy that Erica has just described, isn't open for them. So they're doing incredibly well, but they're having to work harder and take more risks. Does, does that ring true to you and what you've seen in, in, in the city of London? Yes, very much. And what Erica just said is um, is very true. The fact that, um, so number one, uh, lack of diversity is definitely 
an issue. So you end up either, you would like to bring that in innovation sometimes, but there's definitely a sense of you need to understand the um, unwritten rules, you know, um, unwritten codes to be able to adapt and be accepted. So that that is quite difficult sometimes. And as you said, you also have to definitely have a strategy in terms of how you position yourself uh, because uh, working hard is great, but it's ne definitely not enough because a lot of the decisions are not based only on how much you work. It's definitely about um, your image and how comfortable people are with you and how they potentially see you, which is sometimes quite um, complicated, I think, because you do know that you can achieve something, but then convincing other people, especially people who are making the decisions that you have that capacity um, is very difficult because they're, we're coming back to the unconscious bias situation, right? They, do, they think of you as a member of a group, not as an individual. And I think that's what a lot of us are fighting against is we do have the talent, we can bring that innovation and we are seeing very successful uh, people, black women in companies. Unfortunately, sometimes we don't get the right opportunities and either we create niches that where we are the only ones able to do the job and then that's how we get promoted or we just leave and find another job where we can get the right level of pay and the right level of responsibility, which I think um, is a shame to a certain extent to the company because they're losing talent. But also, if we're talking about innovation, being able to create new products for new uh, consumers that we haven't thought about, also, it's also a missed opportunity for the business. And what you describe, Alex, is really inequalities, even for the black women who we look at who are doing incredibly well, right? Because to get there, they've, they've taken so much more risk in order to get to their destination. Yes, I think so. Thank you very much. Um, Heather, there's a question in the chat from Priscilla that I'm hoping that you might take. So um, she would love views on the extent to which imposter syndrome plays a part in the pay gap. Um, and the extent to which black women feel empowered to challenge these gaps. What should organizations do to help people feel more empowered? And what tools should the organization employ to ensure that the onus is not inadvertently on employees to ensure equitable pay? Wow, that's a big question. And there's a long answer for it, but I'm not gonna go into the long answer. I'm gonna, to, uh, I'm gonna say to the young lady to have a look at the work we've done in CMI on the pay gap and how that covers over. I think that's one of the things, but I think there's something else I want to bring to the table here, which is around black women. When we are recruited into organizations, we're recruited because of our qualifications, our experience and our ability to do the job. And there is normally a pay grade in which we should be paid. We just don't know about it, right? And, I, and, and then the other thing for me with that is that when we come in and we bring difference and we're really excited and we're not happy to be there just because we're a black woman, but we're happy because we've got this job despite all the other challenges we've had and then all of a sudden we are told that we don't do it the way they do it so that innovation that you have brought in has suddenly been stripped away no organization can be successful if you haven't got difference and you haven't got innovation coming through the door and innovation means that your clients want more to do with you if your clients want more to do with you then you need to pay the people who work for you pay them the same sort of salary. I've seen some organizations now where they're saying, right, the entry grade for any, no matter what age you are or where you've come from is this kind of salary. And it's one salary, it doesn't matter how much you've done, but that's the salary. And they're trying to do that to make sure that they, that they even out what people get paid. Because if you bring somebody in who's been working for 20 years in an industry, but you need them in your organization, you have to attract them with something that brings in their pension, the salary that they've enjoyed, the risk that they've taken. Because remember, they're not grateful anymore for being in a role. They're there because they, you know, they can uh, do that job. You need to think about that. But then what you have to also think about, and it's the unsaid thing, you come in on a big salary because you've deserved that, but often somebody somewhere will be sitting there going, right, we're not going to give her a good pay rise this year. What we're going to do, we're going to mark her down on her performance, make her feel she's inadequate because she hasn't done it the way we want to do it. And then what happens is that that woman, and I'm saying what most people are thinking, but probably I've never had the opportunity to say, that woman gets performance marked down, she gets disenfranchised, and then she leaves. So not only does she okay. leave and it has an impact on the organisation, it has an impact on that individual who has been successful throughout their career. And that's why I'm a really strong 
champion of people who buddy other people when they come in because you need that introduction to understand the culture of an organization. And I really feel that we cannot let organizations get away by making the women have to fix the problem. It isn't for us to fix, it is the culture. It is the chief execs that set the culture in those organizations. And if they said to all of their leadership team, by the way, if you do not change the way you operate, if you lose any women or any black people out of your business without a good reason, your bonus is gonna be impacted. But it takes guts to do that, right? If you don't do it, you're not going to see the systematic change that is needed. So I would urge the senior leaders that are on this call to go back into their organisations and ask those questions around what are we, how do we really look at our managers and our leaders? Managers will just follow the process. A leader will challenge the process and make sure they're opening up the gates to everybody who has got the right skills despite what inclusive background they come from. And then they're going to create an inclusive platform where that person can be successful because it's about pounds, shillings and pence and the culture. Thank you so much, Heather. I'm going to come to everyone um, to pick their action that they think companies should take. And I'll come to you last, Erica, for your aspirations for the future of Transparent. I saw your hand for a reaction, Anne. So let me come to you for the reaction and also the action that you think every company should be taking. Uh, I absolutely agree with what Heather says. And um, and um, fortunately, my answer ticks both of your boxes, Grace. <laughs> so I think uh, what companies need to do is they need to be transparent. At MasterCard, we publish our gender pay gap globally. It's about 8%. We publish our black pay gap in America because the data is collected, which is 7%. And this year, we're actually linking these gaps because we're linking our ESG goals, but specifically the gender and the black pay gap um, to executive compensation. Fantastic. So if they go, if the gap narrows, the people at the top of the company get paid more, the gap widens, converse happens. And actually, I think doing things like this is absolutely the way forward for all companies. Fantastic, Anne, thank you. And Eric and I are looking forward to working with you and some other companies, if there are people sitting out there in other companies and learning about what you're doing that aligns with the transparent framework. Eric, I saw your hand. Will, will that happen in the UK as well, Anne? Um, it isn't currently because the data isn't collected in the mm. same way, but I think that, well, in terms of gender, it is. Um, and it's self-declaration, as you know, in the UK, which is up to about 75%, but we're trying to solve that issue for us now. Thank you. Heather, the one action that we, you, you, you've given us a lot, which, what would be the one action that you would want people to take today? First of all, I want them to create their circle of trust. You need that for your own self-survival and to build your network. And the other thing I wanna put back onto the organization, this topic needs to be monthly as part of their management board discussions, not a nice little project that sits on the side that's a nice HR project, but actually part of their business strategy. So leaders who wanna drive the change need to include this as part of their monthly management board meeting. I love that. That actually isn't in the isn't in the report, but again, it speaks to the idea of transparency and keeping it on the agenda. Alex, what about you? If we were to speak to organisations today and make one change, what would it be? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, uh, I would talk about um, cultural change. Definitely, in terms of getting uh, talking to black women about their lived experiences in the business. And also realizing that actually, if you address these issues, everyone will benefit. It's not as in all your DNI initiatives within the business will improve on the back of that. And I think that's very important for them to realize that. And this fits well, Erica, with your idea of the benchmarking, doesn't it? Um, so let me pass to you for last words and aspirations. 
So um, aspirations for um, Transparent is that people will start using the framework. They will start to implement the positive um, actions and the recommendations within the, within the um, framework. But we're asking um, as the inclusion initiative that at least four or five companies um, work with us very closely over the coming months. What we'd like to do is start to see um, the implementation of some of the um, recommendations recommendations and track those so that we can um, analyze um, the results and we can make sure that there's no backfiring we can see that they um, that we are making the intended step changes um, for black women within organizations so if there are any organizations on the call that would be interested in um, in undertaking this piece of work with us please please do reach out because we would love to work with you um, and then reassess in March next year year um, in time for International Women's Day to ensure that black women are included in, in your organisations. Erica, can I just say, Erica and Grace, can I just say what a fantastic pleasure it's been for MasterCard to work with you. We're really proud. We're really proud the 30% Club are sponsoring this. It's such an important piece of work. And I've simply loved being on the panel here with such great people in the room. And I hope we'll all be back for International Women's Day to talk about the results that Eric is alluding to. So we'll have companies, we'll track the data, and then Heather will be able to give you numbers <laughs> rather, rather than just actions to take. Um, for everyone on the call, I'm really conscious that we are an in-group. So we obviously care about Black professional women in finance, technology, and professional services. Please amplify the transparent framework, but also Erica's call to action. The companies not just make the changes, but they track the changes because something else Erica heard a lot about was virtue signaling. And we're really trying to circumvent virtue signaling by having the action and tracking phenomenon. If there's a, if there's two more than three to four companies, we'll find the space. So, so do reach out. We're out of time. Um, in, again, in alphabetical order, Erica and Alex and Heather, Dr. Heather, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you today. And I look forward to working with you in the future. And I will see you, Heather, for another event in two days' time. See Thank you, everybody. You. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. I'll see you on Friday, Anne. <laughs> <laughs>